Welcome to All The Way Up Podcast by Jeffrey Mensah. This is the By and Beyond series, a platform where we host insightful conversations that push growth, drive ambition, and shape perspectives of young lawyers. Boy, a warm welcome to another episode of All The Way Up Podcast by Jeffrey Mensah. I'm excited, privileged to be sitting across a very great man. He is a professor of law. A prolific writer has written across a spectrum of many disciplines. He also happens to be the dean of the University of Ghana School of Law, Professor Raymond Atuguba. Prof, a very warm welcome to, to the podcast. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Yes, so, so, so Prof, I'll just recount um, my last engagement with you. In 2017, uh, we had closed mass at the St. Thomas Aquinas Catholic Church. Um, I was about to write my, my end of semester exam, first semester exam. And I recall I approached you and uh, I just asked for advice, introduced myself and I said, Prof, I'm going to write my exam. Any advice for me? You left me with two words. Two words. Don't fail. Don't fail. And uh, at, at that time, I recall how, how down I was because I felt you were going to give me something heavier. But as time progressed, I, I just realized how, how heavy those two words were. It was a mindset thing you were, you were conveying to me for my mind not to entertain the possibility of, of failure, you know, and, and for me, I think that that was solid advice. And before we start, I'll just say thank, thank you very much because I didn't feel, <laughs> I didn't feel. But Prof, um, let's delve into that a bit. Uh, then the question to you would be, what what is your reaction or your approach to an unsuccessful attempt at something? It could be anything. So in my world, failure doesn't exist. Okay. Failure doesn't exist in my vocabulary. Why do I say that? Anytime you, in quotes, fail, Mm -hmm. two things have happened. One, you have succeeded in building a body of knowledge and experience for yourself. Right. Which makes your next attempt easier, better, more likely to, in quotes, succeed. Succeed. Second thing that happens is that you've built a body of knowledge and experience which can help someone else or some other people yeah. trod that path that you have trod easier, mm. better. Mm. If you view it that way, failure is a figment of the imagination. Right, right. Because we never fail at doing something. Right. If you look deeply enough into what you call failure, there's a lot of success. Well, that's again true, true. That's, that's an interesting perspective, Prof. Prof, I will then delve now into, into the, the career of law. Yes. All right, where did it start for you? Uh, who inspired you to be a lawyer? How did the idea cross, cross your mind? So, from the get-go, I never thought about being a lawyer. Okay. I was a teacher's son, sent to school, and I thought I was going to become, at that time, what everybody thought was the best profession around in the North. A medical doctor. Okay. <laughs> so I was studying. Um, form three is when you make the choice as to whether you're going to do arts or science. Okay. And so I chose science. Wow. Because I think the thing was that good students would do science mm. at that time. I don't know if it's still the case. Then a day before, so we entered fourth year and I was a science student in Form four. Okay. A day before classes started, the headmaster comes to the class and says, we have only X number of pipettes and burettes in the chemistry lab. Mm -hmm. And we have more science students than the equipment we have. Mm. We need some science students to volunteer and become art students. (laughs) Wow. So I volunteered. (laughs) And then he said, no. You are not the one we want to volunteer. Uh, We want other people to volunteer. For some storm reason, I insisted. Mm. They sent me to the assistant headmaster. He said the same thing. You're a science student. Look at your grades. You need to be in the science class. They sent me to the priests. In fact, the headmaster himself was a priest. Then my father came to the school with my files from when I was in class one. Mm -hmm. He sat with the headmaster and looked through all my files. He said, this guy is a science student. Why are you allowing him to do arts? I said, I want to do arts. 
my mother came to the school. My elder brother came wow. to the school. <laughs> For some stubborn reason, I decided I was going to switch. That's because at that time I had started learning about Nelson Mandela. Okay. Who was a lawyer? Yeah. Before he went into the liberation struggle, mm, mm. and I wanted to be like him. So that was it. That was it. So was law because of Nelson Mandela. Yes. Prof, that's 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 <laughs> very very interesting backstory to, to to all of this. So so Prof, let's let's go into law school. Okay, let let's go into law school. What what was the experience like in law school? Um, University of Ghana. For for four years, I believe that was for the the Bachelor of Laws. Um, we did it for three years okay. at the then law faculty and then two years in the Ghana School of Law. All right. All right. So so, so let's start f- from the faculty level. Mm-hmm. What was the experience like for you? Because I, I, I recall mine, uh, I was straight out of senior high school, Presbyterian boys. Mm. And I, I just recall how tough it was for me to, to bear the shock, really, because I was used to studying in a certain manner. Mm. Now I'm thrown into a class with postgraduates, mm. people will not to be my parents, and the style is just different, you know? And so I didn't have um, a pleasant first two years. Mm. I'll be very frank. Mm. What was your, your experience like at the law, law faculty back then? It was tough. Mm. It was an unfriendly environment. Mm. Um, all you could hear was threats um, about how difficult the course was. Mm about how much you had to read, about how you are different and you need to establish yourself, and about how half of us will not make it after the first year. <laughs> because at that time, you come into the class, I don't know, 80 students, 70-something students, and at the end, 40 will be chosen to do LLB, another 20 will be chosen to do BA law, mm-hmm. and the rest would have to go to other departments. Wow. But growing up in the North is a tough life. Mm. So I was used to toughness. I was mm. used to going hungry. I was used to going thirsty. Mm. I was used to walking 10, 20 kilometers to school. After walking to the dam to fetch water, walking to the farm to drive away partridges in the morning before going to school. So yeah. my life was toughness. Yeah. So I was prepared. You are built for that. I was built for the toughness. Mm. So I confronted it. Mm. Yeah. And, and the first year, second year, third year, exams? First year was good. Um, tough but good for me. Second year, I started doing business. I started um, a taxi business, which got me okay. off my studies okay, a bit. That's so in second year, I didn't really perform well. Okay. Um, I picked up in the third year. Okay. Um, and, and, and then so graduated. Bro, this this business side of, of things, can, yeah. can you go a bit into it? I mean, were you always business minded or? I think I inherited it from my mom. My okay. mom was always doing business, mm. selling everything. Um, literally everything. Mm. She did almost any business you could think of that um, a rural northern woman would do. Would do. You know, preparing shea butter, brewing pito, mm. selling cigarettes, mm. uh, running a store. Right. Literally everything. Multitasking. Yeah, so I think I inherited you those genes, from, and so sometimes, even to date, I still do little business. Here businesses, there. Yeah. That, that's amazing, Prof. Yeah. So, Prof, for for the the, the law student mm-hmm. who's at the faculty level, school of law level, um, knowing what you know now, because now you're a professor of law, dean you know, of the faculty, the University of Ghana School of Law. What what would you say as some of the key things that they need to note as they approach their study as as law students? I mean. Mm. There are four things that make a great lawyer. Okay. The first is to know where and how to find the law. Mm. You need to know where and how to find it. Are you going to find it at the Ghana Law Report, um, the Ghana, the Council for Law Reporting? Mm. Are you going to find it at the Law Reform Commission? Are you going to find it at the Assembly Press, the government printers? Are you going to find it on Westlaw, Lexis, Hine Online? Knowing where to find the law mm. is the first mark of a good lawyer. Of a good lawyer. The second mark of a good lawyer is analytical skills. Mm. That's what separates the real lawyers from the practitioners. I can tell who is who by the sharpness of the analytical skills. Mm. 
an average practitioner does very little analysis. Right. They would copy and paste from previous briefs and previous statements of yeah. case and roll it out into the courts. Yeah. A real lawyer will apply serious analysis, serious legal analysis to what they do. Mm. The third characteristic of a good lawyer is to be world wise. Okay. Law is at the end of everything. It's never the beginning. Okay. Um, if you decide to get married, are you married? Not yet. Good. If you decide to get married and you approach a young lady, the first thing you talk about is not law. Yeah. You talk about love, you talk about marriage, you talk about children, yeah. you talk about a home, yeah. a family. Mm. And it's only when things get sour that you might need the law or is maybe at the end of courting that you might do a prenuptial agreement, formal yeah. or informal, yeah. or then go to court to do a court marriage. But after several months and years have passed. Yeah. Yeah, so right. law never comes in at the beginning. Yeah, right. The good lawyer knows enough about the sociology and the politics and the anthropology that undergirds every legal issue. Okay. Okay. That's why lawyers are supposed to be learned. Because you're not supposed to know only the law. You're supposed to know a fair bit about everything, everything else, else. So that your legal analysis and your legal conclusions would be well-wise and informed. Mm. The last characteristic of a good lawyer is emotional intelligence. Okay. Beyond being sharp in the brain, you need a lot Emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence. You need to know when your client is lying at lying to you. Okay. Because clients never tell you all of the truth. Yeah. All right. If you're not lucky, you'll find out only in cross-examination. Surprise. If you have enough emotional intelligence, you'll be able to detect when the client is not telling you everything. Mm. You'll be able to detect when your partners are not telling you every, everything. You'll be able to detect how to go about a particular issue to achieve the optimum benefit for your client mm. and not just a hard, direct, rough legal tactic. So these are the four things everyone who needs to be, a, who wants to be a successful lawyer needs, needs to, to work on. Prof, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Now, Prof, how, how many years at the, at the bar are you? So, I applied for graduate studies when I was in Ghana School of Law Part 1. Okay. Because I always knew that I didn't want to be limited to this jurisdiction. Okay. Because it's just one jurisdiction. And to be a good lawyer, to be world-wise, yeah. I thought I should know what happens in other parts of the world. Of the world. So immediately I entered law school, I applied for graduate studies. When I was in final year law school, I was admitted. So immediately after my law exams, I didn't do pupillage, I didn't do national service, I left for graduate studies. Okay. But because the profession values seniority, yeah. I knew I had needed to start clocking my years very quickly. Mm. And I didn't want to spend two, three, five years. I, I eventually spent five years going in and out of the U.S. Okay. That would have made me five years junior to my mates. <laughs> Which is serious. So... I worked as a research assistant, teaching assistant, worked in the library, and gathered enough money to buy a ticket to come back in October to be called to the bar with my mates. Oh, wow. Wow. So I was called to the bar with my mates on 1st October, 1999. Okay. Okay. So, so to, per my calculations, that would make you 20, 20 plus So years. I think this year uh, would be 24. Wow, years prof, at the prof, bar. congrats. So we've done 23 years at the that's, bar. That's amazing. That is amazing. And, and Prof, after the call to the bar, I mean, the next stage really is pupillage. So yes. how, how did it work for you? So I didn't do my pupillage, my formal pupillage, until 2001. Okay. When I came back to do field research for my PhD thesis. Okay. So, so you just killed two birds with one stone yes. at that point? So at that point, I did my pupillage with the Legal Aid Board. Okay. But then I was assigned by the Legal Aid Board 
to the Legal Resources Center. All right. Which I set up with a friend of mine after law school. Okay. So I was working in the center as a lawyer and being supervised by the Legal Aid Board for my people age. Right, right, right. And the, set the center was set up with senior lawyers. Okay. So formerly, Justice Tanko, who's now at the Supreme Court, was yeah. my senior. Wow. <laughs> but wow. I made sure to have over 25 seniors. I would never learn from one person at a time. Okay. So if I have a legal issue, I don't limit myself to guidance from my senior. You run it I by? I would call other seniors in other firms. I would call my former lecturers. Wow. And listen to all of them before I take a position. And so, Prof, with that, it provided you with a, a wide array of opinions to be able to... It made me learn very fast. Okay. I told you at the beginning that there's nothing like failure. And that when you do something, you have gathered, which you believe you failed at, you've yeah. gathered knowledge, information, knowledge, and experience. Mm -hmm. All these senior lawyers have done what I'm about to do several times in their life. Right. So why do I waste time pouring over books when I can just call them on the phone and ask them, how do you do this thing? And after talking to five of them, the rest is normally surplus. Because putting together all of the information from the five people, you have everything you need to proceed. Prof, Prof that's, that's very interesting perspectives <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're sharing. So, Prof, uh, you are the Legal Resource Center. Yes. Um, I, I, I don't know, did that, did that involve litigation experience or...? Yes. So, the Legal Resources Center did three things, I believe. It did public legal education. Okay. For deprived communities. All right. So, you'd go to the communities and tell them about the law so that they can better organize their lives. Mm -hmm. So you tell them about interstate succession law, for example. You tell them about the availability of legal aid. Yeah. You tell them about DOFSU. Yeah. The second thing they did was to actually represent clients who couldn't pay for legal services. Okay. So most of the cases were in criminal law. Right. Because the center was based in Nimama, Mobi, and Newtown, which has a very high crime rate. Okay. And the other bulk of cases came from family law. All right. Marriage, divorce, maintenance of children, that sort of thing. Mm, mm. Yeah. Probably interestingly, I, I also did my, my pupillage as well as national service at the Legal Aid Commission. <laughs> okay. Yes, and, and I must confess, I, mm -hmm. I built a wealth of experience within yes. that one year period. And yes. so I yes. appreciate to some extent, probably not as wide mm -hmm. an extent as yours, but mm. to some extent, Great. the wealth of experience there. So, so Prof, after the, the period of pupillage, mm -hmm. um, what, what, what was the next move really for you? And what inspired the next move? Was it to stay there with them or... Uh, you decided to, to join another firm and... So, in my life, I've never done one thing at the same time. Okay. I've always been in a hurry. <laughs> so, on average, I'm doing three to five things at the same time. Yeah. So, whilst I was doing my doctoral research, I was a teaching assistant at Harvard. I was an assistant lecturer at the University of Ghana School of Law. Wow. I was, so did I mention the pupillage? You haven't mentioned that yet, so, so that's three. Exactly. So I was doing pupillage. I was running the Legal Resources Center. I was a teaching assistant at Harvard, and I was an assistant lecturer at the University of Ghana School of Law. Wow. And all out, throughout my life, I always do three to five things. But now that I'm retired, I do two things. Okay. Okay. And so, Prof, that means after the pupillage period, I mean, you still had things to go to, or, or you were still handling the resource center? I was still, I was the project director of the resource center from 1997, when we set it up, to 1999, okay. when I left for graduate studies okay. in the U.S. Okay. Then I came back in 2001. From 2001, I kept going between Ghana and the U.S. Okay. So from 2001, I became associate executive director of the center. Of the center. Okay. Whilst teaching at the University of at Ghana. At the University of Ghana as an assistant lecturer, and whilst being a TA at Harvard. At Harvard. Then in 2004, I became executive director of the center. Of the center. 
So from project director to associate executive director to promotion to executive, executive director. director. And I did that for four years and left in 2008. And so probably all this was because you, you, you found fulfillment in, in that area? Oh, or? yes. Those were my best years. I was always happy waking up, going to my various jobs. Mm, mm, yeah. mm. In 2008, I left the Legal Resources Center because I had to take up an appointment at the UN as a member of the high-level tax force on the right to development. Okay. Okay. So I had to replace the Legal Resources work, Center work with that one. With that one. There's a certain limit to what you can take as at a human time. being, and you mm -hmm. have to watch it. When you're getting over, you need to take something off if a new thing comes up. Otherwise, you'd get... Um, you break down. Yeah. And I did all this because I was unmarried. Immediately mm. I got married, I had to reduce my workload. Mm, 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 because mm. then you have... New demands. The wife, kids. Mm. Uh, so I worked on the UN project from 2008 to 2010. Okay. And I had to wrap that off because at that point, President Mills asked me to be the executive secretary of the Constitution Review Commission. Com yeah. And so I had to replace the UN job with the constitution. I couldn't have managed double both. both of them. At that point also, I had started an executive master's in business administration at Gimpa. Prof. <laughs> so I knew something had to go off. Mm. And luckily that task force ran into a problem and was rounded up. Okay. So I just shelved that. Off, shelved it. Yeah. Okay. So, so Prof, we'll, we'll touch on these appointments a, a, a mm. bit more. But uh, to wrap up the pupillage stage, for, for a pupil currently undergoing his or a pupillage or law student who's working towards that stage, what, again, what should they look out for? Three things. Mm. One, look out for either a good law firm that has established structures and within which your pupillage will be meaningful, or look out for a good senior who is good at mentoring young lawyers, or both. Okay. If you're lucky, you get both. If okay. you're not lucky, you get one. Okay. But if you realize you are not in a structured law firm, mm -hmm. and you realize that your senior is not giving you attention, you need to quit. Okay. One is enough. If you are in an unstructured law firm, where the senior is giving you attention and knows what they're about is fine. If you are in a structured law firm and the senior is not giving you much attention because two or t three years seniors of yours are giving you the supervision. That's fine. That's fine. But where the two are absent, run. Second thing, don't learn only from your immediate supervisors and your senior. Mm. It's too limited in today's world. Yeah. With cell phones and emails and the internet, why would you focus all of your learning as a people on one human being or a small set of human beings? Mm. Expand it. Go beyond boundaries. And three, don't be afraid to experiment. And experiment even if everybody tells you that what you're doing is foolish and will not work. Mm. Because that might be the beginning of a breakthrough. Solid stuff, Prof. That's, that's, that's solid, solid, solid wisdom for, for the people. Prof. Atukuba and Associates, the law firm that you, you set up, um, at what point in time did, did, did this come into play? And, and, and what influenced it? What made you say, you know what, I, I think I need to set up a law firm? So, I set up the law firm at the point that I had graduated. So one thing was off. Okay. I was no longer a student. Mm. And I had been promoted from assistant lecturer to lecturer. Okay. So I said, at this point, I need to establish systems for my consulting work and my practice. Because I was getting a lot of offers for cases and for consulting uh, jobs. So I decided to formalize it. So I spoke to a few people who eventually became my partners, mm. and we set up a law firm. the law firm. Before that, we had attempted setting up a law practice when I was still in school. And because I was doing all those things, 
I had to delegate it to others. It didn't work. Mm. So when I set this one up, I was more careful in the choice of partners and also in the amount of time I was dedicating to it. Okay. Okay. And that's why I set it up only after I'd taken some other things off my plate. Mm, 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 mm. So it was set up in 2006, I believe in May. Yeah. 2006. We always meant for it to be a boutique law firm. In other words, we'd, we've never seen Atubin Associates as a firm that takes 50, 100 lawyers, no. Mm. We hover at every time between 13 and 18 lawyers. Okay. And that's how, average 15. That's how we want it to be. Okay. Because we need for the firm to be able to give individualized attention mm. to the clients. Mm. Mm. So, Prof, uh, I've noticed, I'm, I'm four years at the bar. Mm-hmm. Uh, more and more of my mates are setting up their own law firms. Um, from where I sit, some of them are, are doing pretty well. Mm-hmm. But well, the question then is, what, what do you think are those keys, those factors that are foundational to a thriving law firm? Um, because again, it's, it's a business you are running, um, aside the practice as well. And so from your experience, Atukuba and Associates, what, what keys come into play? Setting up a law firm, a law practice is easy. Mm. You can do it in a day. Sustaining a law firm intergenerationally it's tough mm. you can set up a firm that dies with you that's easy yeah but establishing a firm that outlives you the challenge the challenge and to do that you need to take certain personal decisions one you need to sufficiently separate yourself from the entity that you're setting up. Mm. So there are times I'm broke. The law firm has money, but I can't touch it. <laughs> because I have to establish a system where 50 years from now, the head of the law firm, when he's broke or when she's broke, cannot touch the firm's money. Yeah. Yeah. But if I start anytime I'm broke, the wrong president. Yeah. You are not building an intergenerational firm. Mm. There are times people I respect would refer people to me to take on either as peoples or as members of the firm. But they're not good. I'll recommend them, let them go through the process. If they don't make it, I have to explain to these people that we can't. Mm. If they are borderline, I can put in a word. Say, okay, this person is referred by X. So let's try out the person. But where the person is not good, you have to yeah. not risk it. Because then you're going to beef up the firm with people of a standard that you don't want to unleash on your clients. Mm. So it's a difficult thing to build a firm that's intergenerational. But I think that's what we need as a country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prof, let's, let's, let's touch on this landmark case. Awuni versus Wayek. <laughs> uh, I'm just doing the calculations in mind. You're called to the bar in 1999. Yes. And this case, I think, cropped up in 2001? 2001, yes. 2000, 2001, thereabout. Uh, Prof, it was battled up to the Supreme Court. Um, in the judgment, certain principles were enunciated that now applied to, to, to cases that, that judges sit on, all right, in our day and age. The, the, the question is, what, what, what was the backstory? Because I get that it was within the period when you were at the, 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 the center. Yes. And so it, it was a center case. Yes. But two or three years at the bar, 1999, 2000, 2001, mm-hmm. a lawyer two years at the bar, battling it all the way to the Supreme Court, Prof, what, what was your, your, your mental space like? Because I, I looked at opposing counsel, mm-hmm. and it, it, he's a big name. Oh, he's good. Yeah. He's, he's good. And he's so one I, of the best in the country. Exactly. 
And so I, was, I, I just wanted to know what, what was Prof's mindset like at that time, going against a, a, a big wig, a legal big wig, um, battling this this huge case up until the Supreme Court. What was it like? What 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 made you first and foremost decide? Look, I'm going to push this case past High Court, Court of Appeal, Supreme Court. And what was your mind space like? Really, that's that's my interest. I told you, don't be afraid to experiment. Mm. And even when you're, sh- when you're sure about what you want to do mm-hmm. and you've done your groundwork and everybody tells you don't do it and you are firm in your conviction that this has to be done, go ahead and do it. In the high court, um, I've forgotten the high court judge's name. Let's say whatever the name was. Mm-hmm. He sent us back more than three times. He said, counsel, are you sure you want to move this motion? Go and think about it and come back. Anytime I went back, I didn't think about whether we were going to move it. I just did more research and beefed up the arguments because I was certain that we were going to move the motion. Mm. So by the time we moved the motion, the judge granted it. The high court judge. The same judge who asked you to go back. The same judge who was not sure granted it. Then in the court of appeal, we lost. Then I said, no, we're going to the Supreme Court because I was convinced that there was a good case about the arguments. So we sat down, prepared a 30 page statement of case, filed in the Supreme Court. I couldn't imagine that that Supreme Court would say anything otherwise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so convinced. I was convinced. 100%. You had Databa on it. You had Sophia Kufu on it. You had Setchum, Pega. Ah, yeah. I mean, how would these people assess a brief based on the violation of the Constitution, the violation of fundamental human rights, no less a right than the right to hearing, mm. and come to a conclusion that this should stand as part of our jurisprudence. I, I couldn't see that it was possible. So, Prof, let, let's, let's flip it. Let's assume that the facts were different, all right? Mm-hmm. And there wasn't as clear-cut a case as you saw. Mm-hmm. Would your approach still be, be different? Because clearly, in this case, you, you believed in the case. You believed yes. in the arguments. Um, if there wasn't such a strong case, mm. let's say a 50-50, a thin line sort of scenario, mm. would your approach have been different? The only thing that would have been different would be my level of conviction. If it's 50-50 and my level of conviction is not high, mm. I'll probably not put as much industry in it. You know what? And I'll just do it maybe as a test. And for some day for someone to build on it. Mm. But in this case, I was 100% sure of the case. Amazing, Prof. Yeah. Congratulations. It happened years back, but congrats on the success. Thanks. Prof, public service. All right, you've, you've touched on the fact that at a point you served as a secretary to the Constitutional Review Commission. Um, and at a point also, you were executive secretary to, to the president. Mm-hmm. Um, let's, let's look at that a bit. Because uh, that, that, it's pointing towards leadership, governance. Uh, first and foremost, you, you were a lawyer being put into a, a, a different space from where I sit. How, how ready were you? And if you assess that you were not ready, what are some of the things that you did to quickly adjust and be able to fill the shoes that were being presented to you to put on? If I tell you the position Professor Mills wanted me to, organ- mm-hmm. to, to occupy, mm-hmm. you would collapse from your share. <laughs> of course I said no and I don't think he fully forgave me for it mm. I said no but I accepted the, the position to be the executive secretary of the constitution review commission. commission mainly because at that time in my life in my early 
to mid thirties. I didn't want to get into a position that was overtly political. Okay. Because I didn't trust the politics of this country. Mm. I thought it was too pedestrian, too vindictive, mm. um, too partisan. So I didn't want an overt political position. Okay. And so I crafted the position within the parameters that the president presented it as a technical position. Okay. So I was never a member of the commission. I was the executive secretary to the commission. The commission. Because I felt that the membership of the commission was political. Mm. But the executive secretary to the commission was technical. It's a safe zone. Um, same thing happened when President Mahama asked me to work for him. Yeah. I started working for President Mahama the day President Mills died. Okay. Uh, but many people don't know that. Mm. Because I was his governance and legal advisor from the day President Mills died. I believe 24th July 2012. Yeah. Until 7th January 2013. But it was a backhouse job. Mm. Nobody... I mean, people knew I was in that position, but it was not a public position. It was yeah. not announced. I was not paid even by the government. I was okay. paid by an NGO. Okay. And then I was working for okay. President okay. Mahama. So it was difficult to trace. Trace it. Exactly. Yeah. As, as overtly political. Yeah. like. Mm. When I was asked to become his secretary, of course, I said no. Uh, because I felt it was too much into the politics. Mm. Uh, so many things happened until I had to say yes. And even then, I said I would only become an executive secretary, not a secretary. Okay. Because if you read our laws carefully, secretary to a president in the way in which the Presidential Office Act, sorry, in the way in which the Civil Service Act of 1993, yeah. which was then the Civil Service Law of 1993, mm -hmm. PNDC Law 333, yeah. was crafted. It actually meant minister to the president. Oh. This is before the Civil Service the part of the civil service law that dealt with the office of the secretary to the president was amended by the okay. Office of the President Act of 1997. Okay. So by putting the executive there, I felt I was removing myself from a ministerial position. Mm. So later on when I heard in the media that I had requested to be executive secretary, because I wanted more power. I just laughed because executive secretary is actually lower. Lower than, than, secretary. than secretary. But of course, they didn't, they didn't their appreciate that. Well exactly. And they didn't know that. Exactly. My plan always was that I would be a policy advisor mm. to the president. Mm. And I always insisted that he should appoint a secretary who would fill that role. Mm. But he never did. Never did. Um, he only did when I left office. When I left office, he then appointed a secretary. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Prof, what, what are some of the challenges in, in both portfolios? I mean, secretary to the Constitutional Review Com Commission, mm -hmm. as well as executive secretary to the president. It's governance. Of course, you're close to politics, mm -hmm. although you, you had been shielded to some extent. Mm -hmm. But what are some of the real-time challenges that would crop up and, and how would you approach? Chief, there are two numerous. It's a whole book. Two numerous to mention. Um, the key things, you have to One, you have to pray a lot. Mm. 
because some of the things that happen are unimaginable. And if somebody told you about them, you would not believe them. No. Oh. You'd only believe them if you see it or you're in it. Hmm. The first thing you, do, you have to do is discover or rediscover your spirituality. Unless you have a backbone of spirituality, you can't survive in that setting. Mm. It's not possible. I can't give details, but it's just not possible. Yeah. So the first thing is discover your spirituality and get anchored to it. Mm. The second thing you need to do is be wise. You have to be as wise as a serpent. Mm in those environments. You can be gentle as a dove, but be as wise as a serpent. Because no one in those circles would ever tell you all of the truth. You will be lucky if you got 90% of the truth mm. from any one person. So my standard operating procedure before I would advise the president on anything or submit a memo to him, would be to talk to five different people hmm. from different backgrounds and different perspectives, even contesting positions. <laughs> and by the time you talk to all the five and you add the 90% truth that each of them gives you, yeah, the you would then picture. finally get close to the right picture. And, yeah. and then you can advise the president. Right. And remember, I came, I was in my 30s. Yeah. I still, don't, I still don't understand why President Mahama asked me to do what he asked me to do. I still don't also understand why President Mills wanted me to do what he wanted me to do. I felt I was too young. I felt I shouldn't be in the positions that they wanted me to be in. So, to compensate for my inexperience, I talked to people a lot. I would chase people, meet them at 12 midnight, at 1 a.m. I used to get home about 2 a.m. Mm. Work in the presidency starts when you have close work. <laughs> <laughs> the irony. Yeah. That's interesting, bro. Professor, so, so I, I guess uh, my next question was, was actually going to be, I mean, for the youngsters that are, are entering into politics, quite a number of us, all right, uh, what, what would be the pointers? But it looks like you've hinted some of them already, um, applying yourself to, to learning. Um, but again, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine. Um, she, she occupied some political portfolio for a while, all right? I think it was about a year to two years. And she, she left. She resigned before um, the tenure was over. Hmm. I asked her why, and she said well, she, she didn't want to be tagged as political. Hmm. She wanted to build her, her career, you know. And and I, I just said, well, let me run it by a prof. What was your take on a youngster? You don't have any form of technical experience entering into politics. What do you need to be wary of? Because I mean, the term of politics it's it, it's limited to certain periods, hmm. and so. I wouldn't advise politics as a startup career mm. path. I wouldn't. Before you get into politics, yeah. hardcore politics, yeah. make sure that you have established a track record, a career track record, perhaps a professional track record before you get into politics. Mm. And always make sure that there's something you can come back to. to. Because you can be sacked the day after you are given the political office. Mm. So I would never advise someone to go directly into politics as a nascent start of career path. Do something. Get good at doing it. Then you can go into politics. Mm. And always have a pathway back. Right. It doesn't matter what it is. Get good at selling tomatoes. 
before you get into politics. Mm. And know the market for tomato so well that the day you are dismissed, you can make a simple entry back into your, back to your business. business. Mm. If you don't have that, your political superiors will know that you are vulnerable. And they'll mess you up. Mm. Makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. When I was in the office of the president, all I had was my handbag. And I was prepared any day I picked that handbag and left the office not to return. Mm. And I knew where I would go to. Should that happen? I return. Mm. Imagine I didn't have four back positions. I'd have to take every nonsense and be quiet. I can't speak up at meetings. I can't say what I think or what I feel. I have to massage the truth to make sure that it preserves my position. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Okay. Prof, let's, let's, let's move to, to academia. From, from the very start, were, were, you, were you aware that this is what you wanted to do? You, you wanted to be in the classroom lecturing? No. From the beginning, I never thought I'd be a teacher. But then when I was in the law faculty, mm -hmm. um, my mates started telling me I'll be a good teacher and so I should teach. Because I had, I don't know, I belonged to maybe four or five discussion groups. Mm -hmm. And I would go to all of them in one evening. And so... It was my mates who first put the idea in my mind that I could be a teacher and be good at it. Yeah. I remember entering a trotro from Accra Tema Station mm -hmm. to Lagon whilst I was at the faculty. And I was at the very back seat with a gentleman who I never met. And between Tema Station and the Legon station. Yeah. He told me three times, he said, you will be a teacher. I've never seen him before. I have never seen him after. The professor. But he said three times that you will be a teacher. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so I always remember him anytime I'm doing my teacher work. Mm. Mm. And, and you enjoy it? You enjoy it? I enjoy it. Yeah. It's, it's actually, it's good to have a privilege to mold minds. Yeah. Yeah. Prof specialization for a lawyer. All right. Uh, the adage is what uh, uh, Jack of all trades, master of none. It's just recently that I discovered there's another part to it. Mm -hmm. It says oftentimes better than a master of one. All right. Um, and so th that's what we, we often see. Litigation, someone is handling all sorts of cases. All right. Um, what, what, what's your take on that kind of approach to practice? Because um, there are also the lot who also will be known for something. And we'll also thrive at it. For the young lawyer, what, what, what would be the, the guidance, the direction? Should we... Both are good. Okay. If you want to specialize in a particular field, you need to really go deep into it. Mm. Way deep. So deep that you know the latest technologies in the field. You know the latest issues in the field. You know the best world-class legal experts in the field, and you are in communication with them, or attending seminars and conferences where they are speaking, and so forth. Mm. You really go deep into a particular narrow area, it's fine. The other option is good. That you make sure that you're, you know where to find every type of law. Your analytical skills are sharp. Mm. You are well-informed, world-wise, and you can pick up any area of the law in a couple of weeks. Be fairly good at it. Mm. Both are good ways. Probably last question on, on specialization. When it comes to the decision, as to what should I specialize in? All right. Um, I, I use myself as an example. I mean, through the faculty to Makola, all I was really exposed to was litigation. All right. So going to court and... It's already you have a skewed 
a mindset or skewed uh, idea of what practice is all about. Um, but then you start being exposed and you realize, oh, that's, that's the financial uh, markets, there's a niche over there, insurance, maritime, aviation. How, how does uh, the young lawyer settle on what to specialize in? Like, what, 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 what should I bear in mind in making that decision? It's a very personal decision. Hmm. Lawyers in Ghana become lawyers for one or four reasons, or a combination of both. As a stepping stone to something else, mm. such as politics. Yeah. Two, for fame, social recognition. Three, for money. And four, for being happy in life and giving back to society. Your choice of specialization is determined by which of these four are controlling your life. Mm. So it's a very individual decision. If money is controlling your life, you can't go and do uh, specialize in um, assistance to um, what do you call it? The vulnerable. Um, Widows mm. who have been cheated of yeah. their little property yeah. in rural Wali Wali. <laughs> you're not going to make yeah, money. You make money, yeah. Uh, if your aim is money, you have to go into land litigation, corporate and commercial transactions, energy law, the mm. things that bring lots of money. Yeah. 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 If you're going to use law as a stepping stone to politics, then you might want to specialize in, say, constitutional law or something like that. Um, if you want to give back to society, of course, human rights and yeah. those areas. Uh -huh. So it really depends. What's driving you? What's driving you? Mm. Mm. Prof, we're, we're concluding uh, work-life balance. Uh, very clearly, you're you're a hard worker. Mm. Uh, I dare say you're a workaholic. <laughs> um, at a very early stage, working three jobs at a time in, in different jurisdictions. I mean, it takes someone who who's really into work. Um, but, but how do you strike that balance? Um, how do you guard against work consuming you and, and detaching you from, from humanity? <laughs> it's a very real danger. Mm. So, as I started growing a family, I started reducing mm. my workload. You know, because you, you can't have a proper marriage if you don't have time to spend with your partner. With your partner, yeah. You can't have a proper home. You can't bring up kids if you don't spend time with them. Mm. So you, you need to know that once you start a family, you have to reduce work. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. And right now, my, my aim is to reduce my work to like one job. From five jobs to one. To just one. So I can focus on the family. On the family. Solid. Prof, emerging areas that young lawyers should look out for. Uh, uh, do any of them come to mind? Not a specific area, but we need to look at the way in which ICTs are revolutionizing the law. Mm. We need to look at that carefully. Artificial intelligence. We have, until the injunction was imposed, the first robot lawyer was going to appear in the New York court. Yeah. About a month ago. Yeah, yeah. Already you have robots that are performing legal tasks in some law firms. Exactly. We need to watch that space carefully. Because we are so conservative as a profession. Yeah. That ICT might move so fast and take over the profession mm. before we realize that it's yeah. been done. Yeah, yeah. Prof, finally, we look at your, your, your book. You have a new publication, mm. uh, The New Constitutional and Administrative Law of Ghana from the Garden of Eden to 2022. Can you just tell us something, something brief about the book, the target audience, and, and uh, what, what you, you believe it, it seeks to achieve? So the key target is law students. Mm. Because... Uh, I've been writing it for 16 years. Wow. And mainly because every year I try to bring it up to date. So this is up to date 
December 2022. Okay. So even in this book, you have the motion of censure against um, the Minister for Finance. Okay. It's discussed here. Okay. The Speaker's ruling on it is discussed here. Okay. You have the appearance of the parliamentarians before the Privileges Committee, mm -hmm. including Ajua Safu, who is a former student of mine. Yeah. All that is discussed here, including the Speaker's ruling on it. So I brought it up to date December 2022. Mm. And it's good for constitutional law, administrative law, and Ghana legal systems and methods. Mm, mm, and that's mm, why mm. its bulk is like 1,000 pages. Right. But it covers these three subject areas quite well. Mm. My guess is we can, we can get it in any bookshop. Right now, we're focusing on the students. On the students, okay. And we're giving it at a rebated price so that students can get it. Once we finish selling to the students, we'll now give it out to the bookshops because at the bookshop price, it's a bit elevated yeah, because yeah. the bookshops have to make some profit from yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, right. So we want to get the students to buy first. And then after that, it can go to sure. everyone else. Sure. Mm. Prof, you mentioned students. I'll just conclude with uh, mm. an experience I had with you. Okay. The first year, uh, legal systems class. Yeah. The first class we had with you, mm. you came to the board and you wrote down, I believe, two questions. Mm -hmm. You turned to us and said, these questions will come in the exam. <laughs> I honestly didn't believe because I thought it was probably a ploy to throw the student off because I was used to that in senior high school. Oh, okay. Exam comes and then these are the questions <laughs> staring at me in the face. And so fast forward to level 300, conflict mm -hmm. of laws. Mm -hmm. A similar incident happened. You write the question on the board mm -hmm. and you say, these questions will come in the exam. Mm -hmm. Prof, I prepared for those questions. They <laughs> appeared in the exam and, and I passed. Prof, on that note, I just want to say thank you so, so much for, for the time. You know, uh, I know you're a very busy man, but making time to speak to us. Uh, I think it was a very insightful conversation. I've learned a lot and I believe our audience will also pick a lot from the conversation I've had with you uh, this, this morning into the afternoon. Right. And so, God bless you, Prof. Thank you very Wonderful. much. Yes. It was thank a you. Great all. interview. Yes, yeah. Prof. Yeah. Okay. And so, watch out for our next uh, episode. It's all the way up podcast by Jeffrey Mensah. Thank you.